Pastor told me about this breakfast and knowing what is also happening at the same time. I asked him, Will they come uh, after such a big event? And he said, Kisumu people are faithful, they will come. And uh, I'm so truly excited and just want to thank each and every one of you. I was telling Governor if I was him, this is a time I would just want to find a place where I can lie down, put my feet up and uh, reflect over what has happened, not to go for another function. So we do not take it for granted that you left all that you could be doing uh, to come and be with us this morning uh, at this breakfast. We are truly grateful to each and every one of you. I was asked to come and uh, just share a few thoughts on leadership and especially 
at this time where uh, there are many things happening around our nation and uh, in our region. I also happen to come from this region and so I'm home and the success of this place is also my success and I, I thank God that we seem to be moving somewhere and we thank God for that. I want to talk briefly about uh, credible leadership. There seems to be many leaders around us, but what you keep hearing around the world, and especially in our continent, is a cry for leadership. A cry for people who can give direction. And so you wonder, what are people looking for? We have so many leaders, and yet very little leadership. And uh, some time back, I, in the course of my studies, decided to do a bit of a study on this subject and find out what do people look for in leadership? What do people look for in a leader that can then bring all people together to rally behind that person, that man, that woman, and what they do. You'll find throughout history, there have been men and women who have rallied people around them and behind them to achieve great things for their communities, for their organizations, for their countries, uh, and sometimes even for the world. What are those things that would make that kind of a leader? And I want to just share a few thoughts of the findings that I found in this study. The study was actually uh, published in the International Leadership Journal. Uh, and it brings out a few things uh, that I thought could be useful to us, even as we gather here. And then I'll wrap it up with an example from the Bible being a preacher. That is my foundation. So I asked about four questions. The first one, for people to define leadership. Uh, these are words that we use. What do you, when you think of the word leadership, what do you actually mean? What are the characteristics of a good leader? What are the qualities uh, of leaders that you really admire? And what are those virtues that you feel a leader should stand for? And it's very interesting the answers that came out of this that indicate who we consider to be a leader and what leadership is. Many people said a leader should be a person who provides supervision for whatever is going on to make sure that things are working according to the laid out processes and procedures. They said a leader should bring guidance uh, to a process, to our community, to the people that they lead, so that people are clear on the direction they need to go to. A leader should be influencing, uh, should cause things to happen, not allow them to just happen by themselves. When a leader does not influence direction, then there is no leadership. Uh, everybody does what they please. So a leader must be able to influence the way things happen. And the fourth one they said is that a leader should be inspiring and motivating. When a leader stands to speak, when a leader gives a vision or casts a vision, people should be stirred up in their hearts uh, to say, yes, that's what we want to do. So a leader should be inspiring and motivating. And I found this significant because the definition we have about a thing determines how we act or react towards it. And so when people give these kinds of definitions about leadership, it means that's what they are also looking for when they think about leadership or leaders. That they want a, a leader who can supervise, who can guide, who can influence, who can inspire and motivate them and be able to do things the way uh, they have promised to do. 
The other thing that we found out in this study is we asked what are some of the characteristics that you would consider for leadership or a good leader. And uh, they said that a leader should be a person who listens and communicates. That when a person comes to you or people come to you that you should have a listening ear. You do not talk before they speak. Uh, some of us are very are used to being heard. And uh, even when people come to you to try and ask for direction or give you ideas or thoughts, you already know what you want to tell them and you don't listen. And uh, many of those people who we asked said a leader should be able to listen to what is being said or the followers are saying. A leader should, interestingly they said, should be a person who learns from their followers, from their subordinates. That you do not have monopoly of wisdom. That you are able to listen to others when they are talking, get ideas and run with them. One of the things that uh, uh, I get amazed at in my own sphere of leadership is that God can give some of the people you consider the least in your team very brilliant ideas that can take you very far in your leadership if you only listen. There's a very interesting story in the Bible about a king. He was, uh, uh, he was not a king, but uh, uh, an army leader. It was called Naaman. Some of you know the story of Naaman. Naaman was a powerful leader, a great leader. But Naaman had leprosy. And uh, he had tried all manner of ways to find uh, treatment for that disease, but he could not find anywhere. So one day, his house girl, his housemaid, came to him and told him, you know, this sickness of yours, I think I know a person who can help you. And Naaman listened. And believe it or not, as difficult as it was, he accepted to follow this house girl's advice. And that's how Naaman got his healing. Sometimes as leaders, we become too big for the people that we lead. No one can come to tell you anything because you know everything. Let me tell you, we do not know everything. We do not become leaders because we know all things. And so, uh, people, these people that we, start, we surveyed said a leader should be able to learn from their subordinates. A leader should be people focused. I think that is straightforward. But most of all they said a leader should be a role model. You should be an example to the people that you lead. And for me I would say if there is any challenge in leadership, it is that one. It is easy to say. It is another thing to do. You know the adage, do as I say, not as I do. But it is this counter one which says, your words speak, your actions speak so loud that I cannot hear your words. If you are telling people to keep time, you should be, as a leader, the first one to be able to keep time. If you want excellence, then as a leader, you must practice excellence. If you want this, then you must practice that and people will follow. So, as leaders, we should be examples and role models to the people that we lead. But the, finally, they said, a leader must be effective. You must not just occupy space, uh, but deliver results. We ask them, what are some of the virtues of respected leaders that you believe others should follow? They said that they should focus on results. They should be people who are credible stand for what they say 
And therefore, when they say something, like we normally say, you can take that to the bank. It's not a person you say something and then tomorrow say, did I say that? Especially for our political leaders who are around. We tend to be misquoted, isn't it? <laughs> I was misquoted. It was taken out of context. But you know, as you are saying that, your followers who are there are hearing you. And they know what you said. And so when you say you are quoted out of context and they know that you, that is exactly what you said, you are undermining your own leadership. It is better to say, yes, at that time I said that, but now in hindsight, I know better. You know, you become a credible person. I remember the former president, George Bush, one time was caught in a similar situation. He said, I spoke because I didn't know. But now that I know, I cannot go by my own words. <laughs> Instead of saying I am misquoted. The other day I was watching uh, news. And uh, unfortunately the president of uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Mr. Stepan, fell. And the following day, the minister in charge uh, stood up and said, those were media creations. <laughs> the president never fell. <laughs> when you do that, you undermine your own leadership. You undermine your credibility. And so if you want to be a credible leader, when you are wrong, say, I am sorry. I said this. It was out of turn. I am sorry about it. If you have got new light and new evidence, say, I have got new information, and that which I said no longer holds. People believe you, and people uh, put their trust in you because they know whatever you say, you believe it, and you can go with it, and you can stand for it. How can we become credible leaders? I want to borrow an example from Daniel chapter 6, verse 1 to 18. For those of you who may have carried your Bibles. And I want to pick the example of Daniel. And just see how this man became such a credible leader in a very hostile environment. Daniel was in captivity. He was a refugee. Actually, not a refugee, but a prisoner, captive, who had been taken from his own homeland and was now living in a different land, not of his own. But in that very environment, Daniel, together with his friends, were able to rise up in leadership in the place where they found themselves. What are some of the things that caused Daniel to be so such a credible person that a foreign king trusted him so much that put him in position of responsibility and authority. Daniel chapter 6 verse 1 to 3 says, It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. From that reading, we find that the first thing that seems to have caused Daniel to rise in his leadership was a spirit of distinction. The Bible says that whereas there were 300 administrators appointed at the same time, Daniel immediately distinguished himself by his exceptional qualities. It means that once he was given his duties, Daniel set about his, his job with complete commitment, 
direction, devotion, and every good thing that can be said that are the hallmarks of an exceptional leader. He was hardworking. He was excellent. There was timeliness about him. He was respected and he respected people. And his work soon caught the attention of the king who began to consider how he may place Daniel in charge of the whole kingdom. I can assure you that the world is looking for men and women of distinction. You as leaders, you know that when you have a person who is working for you or working with you, and they are men and women of distinction, you will definitely want to give them extra responsibilities. The challenge we face in our times is that there are very few men and women of distinction. Many of us, uh, of the people that we serve with and work with, uh, do not deliver. They are not committed. They are pursuing other things other than that which they are supposed to do. And so you find, if you find one or two, three people in your team that are, these, are men and women of distinction, they normally tend to be overloaded. Because every other work duty that comes, you want to give to that person. I, can we choose as individuals to be men and women of distinction? The standards that we have in our country should be raised up. This idea of things being done in a mediocre way because we are Africans should really not be there. Because there is no, the blood that runs in our veins and the blood that runs in those other people's veins is the same. I have studied a bit outside of the country. And I discovered that as I sat in that class, it was not the color of my skin that determined how well I performed. It was the commitment to my studies and that which God has put in my head. And so it did not stop me that I come from Kenya so that I was always the last. In fact, if I dare say, I was always at the top. And it proved to me that there is nothing in us that is different from other people who pursue excellence. It is a matter of choice. If Kisumu is going to be the city to watch, let us commit to excellence. Let us do whatever we do with the distinction, no matter how small it is. It is better to do a few things with distinction than to do a lot of things in a mediocre way. Daniel committed himself, the Bible says, he distinguished himself. If each one of us here can distinguish ourselves, don't care what every other person is doing or saying, but you say, whatever shall be given to me, I'm going to do it with distinction. Let me tell you, Kisumu will be the county to watch. It is possible. It will be the county to watch. People will no longer be going to Rwanda and China and wherever. They'll be saying, let's go to Kisumu and see what, how they are doing it. When a governor, I believe we can do it. Yes, we can. Let's commit ourselves to distinction. Related to that is excellence. Quality and excellence are hallmarks of serious workers. When a leader is committed to excellence, his or her followers will not only look up to him, but will soon strive to do likewise. When a leader lowers the bar, then the followers also lower the bar. Unfortunately, they normally lower it lower. So if they discover that you can tolerate mediocrity, they will even go lower than you expected. But when the bar is always high, then they will take you seriously and they will go higher. And excellence comes in very small things. I discovered that to, be, to develop a cultivate a spirit of excellence does not require rocket science. There was a time I went to 
a university campus, I was looking for a document. And when I went to the dean's office, he had actually called me, they have this document. Could I come and pick it? Pick it? So when I went, I entered his office, and there he was. So he said, ah, you have come, yes. And he began to look for this document. Between me and him, there was a pile of papers and files. The whole table was full to overflowing. I said, this thing was just here. This thing, it was just here. And he turning these papers up and down and here and there. He couldn't find it. We call that filing system, Matthew 7, 7. Seek and you shall find. <laughs> when I left that office, I learned a big lesson. And it changed my thinking. My desk was not very far from his. It was not, the mountain was not as high. But there were a few mounds and hills on my desk equally. So I went back and I said, my desk is not going to have any paper by the time I leave the office. Every day. I began to sort out all the papers, put them in their relevant places and so on. By the time I leave my office in the night, there is no paper on my table. Because I used to think that the more papers on my table, the more busy people will know I am working. When they come and say, wow, pastor, you are really working. No. If you come to my office today, you will not see a single paper. You will be judged by those things. How does your bedside table look like? That's where excellence starts. It is not in how big a road you have built. How does your bedside table look like? Thankfully, we will not know. <laughs> but you know. <laughs> so it is not just my desk in the office, but also my bedside table. Is that where the socks of yesterday are sitting on the table? <laughs> the book I was reading two years ago is still there and all those things when we choose to cultivate a spirit of excellence it will show in every area and a leader must choose that you know how do we keep time for appointments I work with a board uh, our deacon board and I've always been amazed our meetings always start before time. We meet at 7. I have my elder here who served in one of our uh, groups. When somebody comes even five minutes late, it is like they are two hours late. They apologize. You know, I'm so sorry. I go to other meetings, church leaders and so on. Two hours down the road, we are still waiting. Can we choose a spirit of excellence and make this the city that people will come to study? Are you together? It can be done. Just small things, small things here and there. Making sure, I went to Rwanda and I was amazed. We were just passing by the stadium and people were coming, there had been a march. Uh, people were coming from this march. Crowds that had poured out and they came and passed by and you know they went their way. After they left and had passed us, we were in a, a shop nearby. It caught my attention that there was not a single piece of paper that was left behind. If it was near your stadium, <laughs> Because I haven't been to our Kisumu Stadium, so I can't say anything. <laughs> it is worse. <laughs> the governor is saying it's worse. If it was our Nyaya Stadium, the bottles, the cigarette things, the leaves that had been carried, banana leaves to Gorbiro Yavneo, the stones, 
<laughs> that would have been left behind. And I thought to myself, how did they get to achieve this? How did they get to achieve this? Can we do this for our city? I believe we can. I believe we can. But it takes that choice at individual level, not a group. First as an individual to say, I am going to commit to excellence. That's what Daniel did. The second thing we see about Daniel is in verse 5. The Bible says, finally this man said, they will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. This man somehow discovered that Daniel had a commitment to God. Let me say this generally. The world is moving towards a place where God is becoming irrelevant to our lives. As we get more and more developed and more and more exposed, God is becoming irrelevant to us. I want to plead with us, the people of Kisumu. Any, it has been proven scientifically with scientific studies. And I can tell you several. Any people who honor God will succeed. I can tell you that, not just because I'm a bishop, but because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Sometimes I meet people, in, come, people come to my office and asking me things that are, I'm wondering, how will I answer this person? What will I say to this person? And I pray to God, God give me wisdom. And I open my mouth and begin to talk to this person. I don't even know what I'm going to say. But you see, as a leader, you have to say something. Eh? Because that's why they have come. But as I'm talking, ideas begin to flow. Until when this person leaves, I'm thinking, where did I get that? I didn't know I was that clever. It is God who has brought that wisdom. Are we together? Let me ask you, my people, the people of my land, don't become too big. For God. No matter how high you go. Don't become too big. For God. Submit yourself to God. And he will give you wisdom. On how to deal with very difficult issues. Daniel. Was a man who was committed to God. And as a result. He. Was able to succeed. I told you that this has been scientifically proven. A study was done in several leading companies in the U.S. on the impact of spirituality in organizational growth. And this was done in secular organization by a lady called Gracia Zama, a key researcher on leadership studies. And she points out that there has been ample empirical evidence that spirituality in the workplace creates a new organizational culture which em makes employees feel happier and perform better. She therefore gives several examples of companies and he mentions, she mentions companies like Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, Biogenics, Antenna International, uh, Deloitte and Tooch, law firms such as Yorks and Case, Scholar, Fearman, Hayes and Holler, all these are big companies in the U.S. And it was proven through them, studies done in several organizations, that because they have put spirituality at the center of what they do, they were more successful than their peers. And it would be, could be correlated. Sometimes we think that when we have put our structures and systems and what, then we can ignore God and things will run. It doesn't work. Let's put God at the center of all we do. Finally, as I close, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. When Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, 
giving thanks to his God, just as he had done, everlasting Father. We bow in your presence this morning, and we want to thank you once again for the privilege of gathering together as leaders of this county, bringing together different sectors of this uh, county, spiritual, corporate, government, and others. You said if your people will turn to you in a united prayer, you will hear them. Because where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in the midst of them. And whatsoever they shall agree upon to ask of you, you will grant them. This morning, we join our hearts together. We have the heart of the heart of our leader, governor, the dreams that he had, the challenges he has faced, but the future he hopes for. We are praying in Jesus' name that you would come through for us, O oh God. Come through and bring a spirit of unity in his team, O oh God, the people that he needs to work with in this county. May you unite their hearts together like you did for Nehemiah. And in 52 days, he was able to rebuild the broken walls of Jerusalem. May you do the same for the city of Kisumu. There are many broken walls of God. But we know that if all these leaders come together in a united spirit and force, there will be nothing that is impossible. And so I pray that your spirit would help them to lay aside all kinds of divisions, acrimony, and all the other things that cause them not to work together. That, Lord, they may come together for the sake of your people who live in this county. And that, Father, begin, we will begin to see things happen that we never imagined would happen in Kisumu. Lord, I pray in the area of governance, I pray, Father, that you grant them wisdom when they sit together to deliberate on issues that affect this land. Lord, I pray that your wisdom will be upon them, whether as MCS or as the executive, other sectors of national government, that, Lord, you'd unite their hearts together and they will be able to deal with issues that have affected this county for so long. This is a land that is so strategically positioned by the lakeside and yet has lagged behind for so long because our mindsets are not for development. Forgive us, O oh God. We are praying for transformation of the way we think. Paul writing to the Romans said, Be ye transformed in your minds. Father, I pray that that kind of transformation will take place in our minds. From the lowest person on the street to the highest person in government, that, Lord, we begin to think development. We begin to think growth. That we begin to think, oh, Lord, in a way that will make this city to move forward. We have been given an example of what happened in Yalenda. Great ideas, but are met with opposition and resistance. Grant us a change. Give us a change, O oh God, that this city may be transformed. I also want to pray for favor. Favor from within and favor from afar. That God, even out of that which has just taken place this week, the gathering that came here, may this just be the beginning of many, many other gatherings that will come and bring blessing in this county and in this city. That God, we are going to see this place turn into a tourist attraction. The place to be. That the Kisumu International Airport will not just be by name. But that planes will land here from far and wide. Bringing men and women from afar. Wanting to do business in this place. It is possible. I have seen you do it and you can do it. And so I'm praying and joining our faith together and asking transform us. Remove the cobwebs that have cluttered us, oh God, for so long and held us from moving forward and release your favor upon the land that it may begin to prosper in ways that we have never known before. May Kisumu be the place to be, the place that everybody's running to. Bless our land, oh God. Bless our, our, our businesses. Bless our schools. 
our colleges, our health centers, our roads, our farms, everything, oh God. We pray for your blessing to be upon this land. May this day mark the beginning of a transformation in the land because we have gathered in your name. And so we commit our leaders to you, whether they are MCS, whether they are county executives, whether they say governor and his team, whoever is given a responsibility in this county, Lord, we are praying for every one of them, those who are here and those who are not here, that they will just begin to sense something happening in their lives. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers because you have prayed it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Okay. As the governor sits down, the chief officer, if you're in there, he wants just to recognize us. Chief officers. Let's appreciate the chief officers. Amen. Sorry to take your time, but as I was praying, I was reminded of something that happened in my village that I thought I should just share with you very quickly, Mr. Governor. As I was growing up, I grew up in a place that you may not even know. It's called Aboke. If you Google it, you will not find it. <laughs> but Aboke was a great place as I was growing up as a young boy. In that little marketplace, we had three bakeries. We had a, a sisal processing plant. We had a coffee collection center. We had a cotton ginery. We even had a soap factory called a boke soap that was sold in this region. It was a great place to grow up in. Then something happened and the place died. Literally died. By the time I was in university, until recently, whenever I was going home, I would stop in Kisumu, do my shopping, and go home. Because you couldn't even buy a loaf of bread. There was nowhere to buy milk or anything. All the shops were closed. They were turned into residential houses for teachers who would pay 200 shillings a month. The place was dead. A few years back, when I was now a pastor in Valley Road in Nairobi, we had a program of going back to the village and we mobilized our members, go back to the village and help your people. So we got a team and we went back to Aboke. And we had crusades and meetings and things and we were doing. And on the last day, we had a meeting at the marketplace. And something stirred in my heart, I said, to the visitors who came with me. Would you pray for Aboke since we believe in a God of resurrection. For this place to resurrect. And I asked the people of Aboke, those of you who are old and remember the old Aboke, do you remember how it was? And they said, yes. Would you like our visitors to pray for us so that this place is revived? And they said, yes. And one of our pastors came and prayed. The way I've prayed just now. And we went back to Nairobi. About six months later, I went back home. I approached home our home you can approach from three different directions. I approached through uh, the direction where I don't have to pass through the market center. So when I got home, I didn't have batteries for my spotlight. So I told my mom, ah, I forgot to buy batteries for my torch. Now we'll have to drive all the way, about 10 kilometers is the nearest market center to buy. He said, ah, batteries, you can buy here at Aboke. He said, Aboke, you can't even buy sugar. Are you, where will you get batteries there? He said, no, Aboke is now okay. You, are, you, you can buy anything. I said, what? So the following day I went. 
When I went to Aboke, I was shocked. The place had opened up. There was even a place for watching DSTV. <laughs> you could buy anything. As we speak today, we even have street lights. God can bring transformation. And I believe that Kisumu being the center of Nyanza region, God can revive this city and wake it up. The Kikomis and the Wat and all those things that died can begin to come up again. And this can be the center of great things. What he did for my village, I know he can do here. I just thought of that as I was praying and I was reminded of what happened in my village. Now if you Google, you can find a bokeh. <laughs> just Google. You can even see my, ho my home. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>